Hi, my name is uh, Ken Kunkel. I am a, a I'm an attorney. I do trademark, copyright, uh, intellectual property, entertainment, uh, pretty much it. My primary focuses are though in intellectual property, uh, and again specifically in copyright and trademark. And of course my, my skills are not in IT, which is why I had to throw together a slide here right before I got here because my thumb drive didn't work out, so I should have talked to you over there uh, to get this all straightened out. So we're going to be a little loose on uh, what I originally wanted to talk about. First thing I wanted to talk about though is what is intellectual property, just to give everybody a real baseline, everybody thinks they know it. I'm not going to be talking about all these things, but I'm going to tell you what I'm not, you know, they always say, tell people what you're going to tell them about and then tell it to them. I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to talk about and then I'm going to tell you some other stuff. So, first thing I'm going to do, going to do is I'm not going to talk about patents. If you're familiar with patent law, patents is about uh, things. I, you know, did I make an invention, a physical thing, typically. Uh, so we're talking about invented things. Patents last for a shortened period of time, like 17 to 20 years, do you, do you recall? I think? You've been in law school sooner, more recently than I know. Um, patents, though, is a constitutional concept. Um, interestingly enough, patents and copyright are both originate out of the, out of the Constitution. So if, I, if I'm a copyright lawyer, I can say I'm a constitutional lawyer. Patents, so, like I said, are about um, uh, ideas, if you will, or, or Invention, inventions, that's the easiest way to talk about. Copyright. Copyright is about the expressive, expressive expression, if you will. I'm going to express an idea or a concept and how I actually put it out there. So I write a book. I'm expressing it through the words. I put, make a music, uh, a song, or a recording of some sort. Again, I'm expressing it in some way. That's what copyright is all about. Trade secrets, I'm going to jump down. These are the things I'm going to keep secret. I don't, they aren't usually protected by the other areas of trade of uh, intellectual property. The only way that we can protect <laughs> that is through just keeping it secret over time. Some great examples of that are usually formulas for things, uh, recipes. I get calls all the time, people saying, I want to copyright my recipe for chocolate chip cookies or something like that. Tough. You can't really register a copyright in that. Uh, a requirement of both patent and copyright law, again, going back to uh, the fact that they're rooted in uh, constitutional law, is the idea that they wanted to promote the you know, development of society. And by doing so, we're going to give you an exclusive right to maintain your patent or to exploit it, or the exclusive right to exploit your copyright for a limited duration of time. But in exchange for that, you got to expose that to everybody else so that they can see it. Okay? Trade secrets, on the other hand, is, doesn't have that basis. The whole root of why it's protected is it's secret. So that, that brings us to trademarks, and that's what I'm primarily going to talk about today. <coughs> trademarks. What are trademarks? Well, um, trademarks basically are any mark, slogan, design, logo. That can be a color. It can be a, a sound. It can be anything that distinguishes your product, goods or services from another. So that when somebody sees this, you know, sees your name, they know that that's you and your business. When somebody hears a sound, the sound of a Harley Davidson motorcycle, they say, oh, that's a Harley Davidson. I, I know that sound. And it's unique and distinctive to that particular company. Might be a color. Um, but, you know, the other day, I, well, last year I registered uh, the color orange with regard to a, uh, uh, a motor. They paint a specific color. And that's a unique to them, so that when people see that, they know that that's my client's uh, specific product at that point. Or uh, probably the more famous ones, the pink the insulation, right? Corningware, corningware. You get the idea. You've all seen it, you associate it at that point, okay? So it can be a name, like I said. It can be a logo, a design of some sort. It can be a, a slogan, for example. Any of those things. Anything that serves it in that purpose. I don't think a smell has been registered yet in the United States, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> there, there might be, actually. I'm not sure. Uh, or think about the blue box uh, that uh, the jewel, jewel who, was, who does that? Does anybody know? The, those are blue Tiffany, box. Tiffany's. Tiffany's, thank you. See, I just had to say blue box, and you knew exactly <laughs> what it was. 
So it's really anything that can distinguish your products or goods and services from that of another. It has to serve as an identifier. Uh, there are some restrictions. For example, we don't give trademark protection uh, to what they call slanderous or scandalous material. So, you know, swear words, for example. Can't do a registration on something like that. Uh, you've probably all seen the Redskins case with the Washington Redskins. That's what that case is about. Scandalous material was being deemed immoral material by the, uh, the courts. So once we decide the general idea of what we're trying to accomplish with the trademark, um, sorry, bear with me here for a second. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to start my timer, so you gotta tell me when I'm done. So. Um, we're looking at distinction. Now the thing is, from your perspective, if you're looking to protect yourself, why do you wanna look at trademarks? The main reason is, you want to make sure that you have a strong trademark or a mark that's going to work for you. Because otherwise, if you're going out and you're starting a new business and you invest the money in the promotional materials, the branding, if you have physical product, you might be imprinting it and you know, cast, you know, dyes and cast and things like that, you're spending money to brand yourself. You don't want to spend all that money only to find out either A, you're already using somebody else's trademark, or B, your mark is so weak that somebody else is going to come in and can and utilize it when basically take advantage of the effort that you put into building that brand. When we talk about trademarks from a tr from a, a, a legal perspective, trademark attorney perspective, we, we look at different levels of distinctiveness. In order to serve as a trademark, a mark must serve to be distinctive. On the weakest level are things that are generic. If I open up a new business and I sell milk and I put on the name on my business as milk well that's not very distinctive I've used a generic name at that point I can't through the process of trademark law lay claim to a generic term right <coughs> doesn't make sense wouldn't be fair to the rest of the world <coughs> similarly descriptive marks um, a descriptive mark is something and this is the challenge for anybody that's marketing business or product. As a marketer, you're looking at this and you're saying, I want a mark that's going to tell people what I do, right? It's the easiest way to, to get market share and telling them what you do. But the downside of that is if all you're doing is describing it, well, we don't allow that. We don't allow you to claim exclusive use of something because we want other people to be able to use things to describe the goods and services. So examples of that might be uh, Got some good examples here. Um, Vision Center, uh, raisin brand for breakfast cereal, chapstick, okay, uh, North Star, whatever you might want to call it. North Star, by the way, is a geographical description, and so it's just similar to other descriptive terms, since it just describes a geographic area, you can't lay claim exclusive use to it. Adina Realty, okay, Adina. It's just saying where the business is and what it does. It's a realty company. Right? Those are descriptive marks. Now, a word about that. Just because it's a descriptive mark doesn't mean it can't become distinctive. A diner really, for example, you know, uses that mark all the time, right? Eventually, in your mind, you may very well associate that mark with that particular company, Raisin Brand. You associate that particular product, even though all it really is doing is describing it you have to acquire the distinctiveness. Now, that usually takes time and money. So if you're planning on coming up with a descriptive mark, you want to be prepared to put some money into it and some time in order to acquire that market share. Because really what you're doing is you want to win over the customers so that they only associate that mark with you. If somebody else jumps in at some point and begins using the same mark before it's acquired distinctiveness, you may very well lose out on that point. Okay. On the flip side of that, that's my little X, 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 X's here, is things that are considered distinctive right away. And we've got marks that are suggestive. The marks such as, uh, um, let's see, oh, I have really bad examples here. Uh, Playboy for men's magazines, 7-Eleven for stores. You know, it's a store. It suggests what it is. It's a store that's open from 7 to 11, right? Um, Best Buy, I would argue, is a suggestive mark. It's 
the place where you can get a, the best buy, right? So these are suggestive marks. They're not, they don't describe it, but they pretty heavily hint. It's a little hint about what the product is about. Typically, this is usually where you want to be just from a, a balance, not, it's not the strongest of the marks, but just from if you're balancing legal protection with uh, your marketing and your challenges, usually suggestive is where people want to be because you can kind of hint at what the product is. It's a little easier to convey that to clients and customers at that point as to what, what the products or services are. The next on the level is, and this is just a little bit stronger, are what they call arbitrary marks. Arbitrary marks are things like uh, Apple. Apple is, is the great example, or uh, Grey Goose Vodka, um, Google. These are all real words, right? But they don't really have anything to do with the product or service that they represent, okay? So as a result, when you apply them to a mark, apply them to a product or service, that creates additional distinctiveness of you from competitors like that. And the last example are fanciful, or, or co sometimes they're called coined marks, and these are words that are just completely made up. The, example, the examples everybody always uses are Xerox, uh, Kodak, things like that. These words didn't exist before. I was wondering about this earlier today. A mark, there's, uh, sometimes you, you have a mark that becomes so famous that uh, it no longer actually means anything because everybody uses it. Escalator, for example. That's a, oh, I'm sorry, what? Kleenex. Kleenex, good, great example. They fought hard though to keep their, <laughs> their mark yeah. as a zipper. And I thought to myself, I was trying to figure out, did zippers start out as something else or was that a fanciful mark to begin with? And I can't think of any origins of the word zipper except just, they just made it up one day. But now we can't think of it as anything else except that thing, right? So when you're choosing a mark, you want to consider this. I get people coming in all the time and they want to use some mark that just describes things. And I just got to tell them, no, you, you can't register that mark. You can't really use that mark. Or at least if you're going to use that mark, you got to be prepared that other people might come in and start using it as well. So how do I get a trademark? Well, what they call a common law, which is uh, basically, a, you know, legal speak for it just is. Uh, common law is basically under the states, as soon as you begin using a mark, there is no requirement. Unlike patents, where you have to register a patent with the Patent and Trademark Office, a trademark you can just acquire through common law rights, which means as soon as you put it out there and consumers start to look at that mark and associate it with you, you own common law trademark rights at that point. Now, you'd say, well, great, then why do I need you as an attorney <laughs> at that point? Well, first of all, you want to make sure you're not infringing other people's rights when you adopt that, law, that mark. And second of all, common law marks uh, have limitations. Uh, typically, the biggest limitation is common law marks are limited to the geographic scope where your products or services are sold. So if I'm selling a product, um, and it's a great product, but I'm only selling it to people within a 10 mile radius of my restaurant, for example. Well, then my trademark rights only extend for those 10 miles. So if somebody sets up their restaurant, and that's an arbitrary number. But say somebody then sets up a competing restaurants 12 miles away using the same mark. Well, I don't, because the consumers that would go to that restaurant wouldn't necessarily be going to my restaurant. There's no confusion by consumers. I don't have rights that extend beyond where my consumers and customers go, okay? So that's one of the reasons you register a trademark. If you think you're going to be expanding and going to a wider markets, typically, especially if you're going anywhere interstate, meaning to other states, and we're pretty close to Wisconsin, so it's probably not a bad idea, <laughs> you want to consider registering your trademark. And because what it's going to do when you register the trademark it's going to put nationwide notice, and it's going to give you the exclusive rights to that mark throughout the entire country all in one shot, okay? So no, no longer do you have to worry about, um, you know, maybe you've set up your, your new shop here in town, and you've decided you're going to start selling. I have a, a company that sells honey, for example. They started out locally. They're beginning to sell, you know, they started, went into Wisconsin, and they're slowly expanding across the country. 
Well, they wanted to make sure that their mark was protected nationwide. You just have to, it's part of that process. So immediately, one of the benefits of registration is nationwide notice. The other thing is it gets you into federal courts, if you want to go into federal courts, which can be pretty beneficial if you need to enforce your rights. The other thing is if you have a product, like a physical product um, that might be copied, or maybe you're even selling, you know, getting it made overseas and bring it, importing it back to the United States. Well, by having a federally registered trademark, you can go to the Customs Enforcement Office and say, uh, we have this trademark, we know that there are people that are going to infringe our mark, we want you to keep anything except our product out of the country if it's using this mark. One of the main, another big benefit. Quite frankly, one of the other benefits that I don't list is just, it's part of that notice, getting noticed to everybody. It helps to um, keep away competitors to a certain extent. You know, maybe they have a mark that may or may not infringe, but by having that federal registration, it does help to discourage many people from even trying uh, to, to uh, utilize the same mark and compete. Okay. So what's the registration process? Well, you can do it a couple different ways. The way I do it, you know, there's different ways. You can obviously go, every different attorney does it different ways. Different services do it different ways. I'll just tell you about how I do it. When you come to me, what I do, I do all my trademarks on a flat fee basis. What I do is, the first thing I do is I screen that mark. And so what I do is I look for, you know, is it, how distinctive is it? Is it a generic term you just told me you wanted to use? Well, is, it a, is it a swear word? Well, I'm going to tell you, no. Okay, it's not going to get registered, so don't waste your money. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to search the uh, government websites. So I'm going to go to the USPTO. I'm going to look at uh, some international databases as well. If I'm going to do a Google search. Uh, I might do a search for social media handles. That allows me to spend a little bit of time to find um, competitors, okay? People that are already using that mark. If I think if I think it's a pretty good mark and it's not going to have any obvious problems, I'm going to give you a thumbs up and we're going to proceed to registration. Now I should say there's two different kinds of screening processes that happen: an informal screen like I conduct, or there's also a formal screening process, which has to do with protecting yourself against litigation. It's a, a lot more exhaustive process. But uh, uh, so I don't want to necessarily get into that. But an initial screen is normally what most people do at that point. Uh, goods and services. Now, I will say just to, to badmouth some competitors, uh, <laughs> LegalZoom, <laughs> companies like that, they're great. They do some things very well. But you're not getting things like screening done at that point. They take you for what, you're, what you say you have. There's no screening involved in that process. My next step is I take a look at the goods and services. So one of the things you have to provide when you re provide a registration to a trademark is what am I using the products on? Because similar to that geographic limitation, your mark only extends to the products and services that you use them on. So if I have a mark and I use it on uh, food products, I can't turn around and tell somebody that makes um, pumps, industrial pumps, they can't use that same mark, okay? Because those products are completely unrelated. If I put myself, one thing, whenever we talk about trademarks, I should, should have said this. One thing to always keep in mind is, put your, you always have to put yourself, take yourself out of your own shoes, put yourself into the shoes of your consumer. Would a consumer be confused between these two marks? Not you, because you know everything about your mark and everything about your industry. Your customer doesn't. So would a consumer be confused? Now, a consumer wouldn't be confused between my potato chip company and my industrial pump company. But they might be confused between my potato chip company and my soft drink company, right? So it, it's really about looking at that. So one of the things I do is prepare goods and services to describe exactly the scope of the protection. The next thing we do is we provide a specimen of use because you actually, uh, for there's two different types of trademarks. You can have an intent to use trademark where I'm not ready to use it yet. But if you are using it, you have to provide evidence that you're actually using it. And so you provide a specimen of use. That typically involves like a photo or a screenshot of the mark actually being used to advertise and try to get sales. Okay. Dates of use. When did you first start using the mark? And you have to provide that information. 
it, the applications actually say the dates of first use, um, and you, you actually end up saying at least as early as this date. Ideally, you want to get that date as far back as possible um, because if you don't, somebody else might come in and say they had something even earlier. And it, it makes it even more difficult to maintain your protection at that point. Give you an example of this. Um, I had a client who started a company. They went out and did some activity surrounding the mark. They marketed themselves a little bit. They then went out and they did some uh, like in-house parties and that kind of stuff using the mark. Somebody else came out on the other side of the country, started using a similar mark. They also had a party to start marketing their product same day across the country. Uh, the dispute then came down to who was actually using it at these little parties. And so that date can come down to, a, even down to a specific individual date. So you want to go back as far back as you reasonably can make an argument for. <laughs> There's an application that's, uh, that's done to the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office. That gets filled out along with a filing fee, typically $275 uh, per grouping of goods and services. Uh, it's then examined by an examining attorney. These are all actual attorneys that work for the USPTO who review the mark. They say, well, um, the goods and services look like they're, they're as specified, technically correct. Dates of use are in there in a way that's supposed to be there. I'm not seeing anybody else out there that's using the same mark in a similar manner that has registered the mark before, they don't go outside of looking at the trademark office. They just focus there. And if, if everything's good and they give a thumbs up, it then moves forward and they put it into publication, which means the rest of the world gets a chance to say yes or no, I like this mark, or I object to this mark. If nobody objects, it then issues at the point. You then have, are the crowd owner of a new trademark at that point. Trademarks uh, typically last for about 10 years. You do have to tell them that you're still using it after five years. That t every 10 years, a renewal is required. Um, real quickly, because I think I'm running out of time here, is uh, policing your mark. You've invested your time and your money getting a mark. You've acquired that distingu distinctiveness where people now associate that mark with you. Maybe you've invested in the registration for the United States. Maybe you've extended that to uh, other countries in the world. Uh, oh, by the way, that's one of the other benefits of registering. If you do business in other countries, having the U.S. registration you can use to then piggyback onto uh, uh, international filings as well to other countries. Let's say now you want to, one of the requirements of your mark, if you have it now, or, or a trademark of any type, is you need to police it. If you find out there's other five other people out there using the same mark for the same goods and services, and, they're, they're, and it's confusing your customers, well, what's going to happen if you let that go on forever? Consumers are going to be confused at the point. There's no likelihood of confusion anymore, and you've probably lost your rights to the mark. Uh, it might not be generic, like in the case of Kleenex that we had earlier, but it's your, the exclusivity, the distinctiveness <coughs> dissipates. So I always recommend you monitor. Um, you can do that by having services to check the trademark office to check for possible infringements uh, or other marks that are being <coughs> registered for. Uh, social media is a great way. Just occasionally Google things, say, is there somebody else out there using this mark, uh, and so forth. You also want to keep your records of your use. That first use date, like I was talking about, you want to keep records of that in your files so that if some conflict comes up at a later point, you can point to the evidence and you have the evidence in hand. If there is a problem, and you've confirmed that you're not the infringing party, because <laughs> unfortunately that happens all too often. People will decide that they have all the rights in the world, and they'll immediately send off a cease and desist letter. They'll say, I, I have the rights to this. I have a registration, only to find out the other person actually has prior rights to it by two or three years. Uh, you want to make sure that, that you actually <laughs> have the exclusive rights before you file, send off that cease and desist letter. I call them nasty grams, but cease and desist letters. Basically, a letter off to the other party saying, listen, I have rights to this. Uh, there's a likelihood of confusion by my consumers and your, con your consumers. Uh, we need you to stop doing this immediately. And hopefully, you'll be able to work things out most of the time. Um, that's really all I have today. So any questions? About yeah. Yes. Uh, 
a lot of people start a business or have a business and they don't realize that they might have something of value. Do you do audits for people? Say, let's take a look at what you've got. Sure. Yeah, in fact, the other day, just the other day, I, uh, I spoke with a, a I called a, a company that I actually used to work for before I became a lawyer. And I was talking to a guy who uh, was working there, and they had just sold the company to somebody else. And it came out during our discussion that nobody had ever transferred the, tri the rights for their trademarks at that point. Uh, and, you know, they also own a lot of copyrights as well. I said, well, you really need to get this stuff taken care of. Because what had happened in their particular case is they allowed their trademark because they had not audited it and checked it when the transfer had occurred. They actually let one of their trademarks expire. Um, and because nobody had bothered to check it to make sure that they knew what everybody had. So it, it is something to consider when you're, when you're going through that process. Uh, the, the other thing I just remembered I wanted to mention real quick, a couple of myths that I often see. One thing that often comes up, people ask is, uh, I registered my name with the, trade, with, the, uh, with the Secretary of State. I started my business. And I started my business with Secretary of State, and, and all of a sudden I got these emails from a, a, a new business, Minnesota. So I must, be, uh, I must have my trademark rights already. No, because a tr that just means you have a trade name or a business name. That is different than a trademark. Mm -hmm. I always use the example of, uh, I always like the example of Subtype. I believe their corporate name is Doctors Dietetic Association or some, something like that. I can never remember the Doctors exact name. Doctors Inc. Okay. Doctors Inc. Because I think they wanted to start the company based upon uh, you know, funding their, their uh, medical school careers. Well. Do, does anybody ever go, I'm going to go get a meatball sandwich at Doctors today? No, they, they don't. They say, I'm going to go to Subway to do that. Um, that is their trademark, not their company name. So your company main name may very well be a trademark as well, but they are not inherently uh, the same. So you have to be careful about that. I received a cease and desist letter for a client a while back where their comp the person asserting their rights had a company name that was similar to my clients. They don't do anything the, the same. Um, and they operated under, they actually used a DBA of a name completely different from that. Well, so what? <laughs> There's not, nobody's gonna be confused. They're different products and it's your company name versus your, your business name. Um, the two other last real quick things I wanted to mention as well, just cause they're really common uh, things I get, questions I get. Um, trademark symbol, that little circle, R, circle with an R in it, that's only used for registered trademarks. If you are using an unregistered trademark or a common law trademark, you want to put a TM next to it. You don't necessarily have to use it all the time, but I do recommend you do that to protect your mark. It helps put everybody on notice. Once you get a registered trademark, you want to put that circle R next to it. Uh, the other thing is, just because I get this question all the time, is I want to put something on my t-shirt. I've got a t-shirt, a really cool idea for this phrase, I want to put it on the t-shirt, can I register that as a trademark? Well, no, because that is an expressive piece of content that's not necessarily a distinguisher. That doesn't necessarily distinguish where I bought it, okay? Yeah, if it's a Nike logo, but if it's something else, any company could be selling the t-shirt. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a distinctive part. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Ken. Apologize for being here.